Well, thank you very much, everybody, for giving up your Sunday morning um, to be here. I don't know what you'd normally be doing on a Sunday, but um, I usually start off with a bit of body combat to get out all my frustrations of the week. Um, health ministers have been featuring my visualisation during that recently, followed by some body balance so that I can calm down and, and face the week ahead. So um, I'm, I've given up that for you. So. Um, First thing um, I want to just quickly ask is how many of you haven't read the letter of the 17th of December? Oh, good. That means I can cut out a lot of my presentation. And um, I do apologise, it's a very wordy presentation and it's a kind of one, five, it's one size fits all. Um, and the truth is, had I had more time this week, it's been a very busy week, would have had time to put a shorter presentation together. Um, so I'm just going to really skip through the slides because um, you obviously know a lot of the background and the context. And before I start, I think it is worth saying that um, the RPS comes at this problem, and it is a problem, from a slightly different perspective to PSNC or Pharmacy Voice. And that's because we don't represent contractors. Um, many contractors are our members, but we actually represent the needs of pharmacists. And in our charter, um, we have to be very patient-focused as well. That doesn't cause us a problem. It just means that what you sometimes see from us will have a, a slightly different flavor to it than the other organizations. But we are all working together to try and be as joined up as possible. So um, that's what we're going to do, um, the breakout sessions later. And although there are breakout sessions today, there are four areas we're particularly interested in feedback on, particularly if you have any positive ideas, because unless we come up with um, new thinking, then uh, we, we stand to lose the money that's being put aside. Now, you all know what the letter said. Um, they claim to be, the DH claimed to be putting pharmacy at the heart of the NHS. Seems a bit of an odd way to go about it by um, cutting the funding, but that's what they've decided um, to do. The cuts seem to be very treasury driven, and um, we can fight the cuts this year. We can um, use or di divert a lot of energy to that. But I personally think, and my organisation does, that it's more important to actually try and come up with a constructive plan for the future, how best to use community pharmacy and pharmacists. Um, otherwise, we'll be faced with cuts in future years. Um, it's clear Osborne has been saying austerity hasn't ended, and um, there are likely to be more cuts announced in the budget. So we have to actually put a lot of positive energy into looking forward. So, you'd be glad to know we didn't um, uh, support the 6% cut in funding, and that was quite simply because the, the quick and easy way to respond to those cuts if um, you're on a very tight budget is we, we, we were worried that a lot of people would respond by maybe cutting staff or cutting hours. And at a time where the government is trying to take the pressure off GPs and off um, a and E, it seemed a bit perverse to be closing down the network that, to, that can help provide that buffer. So actually it was all, a lot of our response and our concern around this was about access and um, the potential for diminished access. And particularly as there seems to be a, an ambition to cut pharmacies, um, I'm not sure how many of you are aware, the minister was in a meeting where he wasn't aware there was a, a record and the record had to be published and he was rather more candid than he might otherwise have been and he did at one stage say up to 3,000 pharmacies could close. Since then he seems to have backtracked um, quite a lot and said it's not all about closing pharmacies. But clearly there is an aspiration to reduce numbers but nobody seems to have um, any sort of plan as to how to do that and one of the things that we're rather concerned about is there doesn't seem to have been an adequate impact assessment um, and certainly no impact assessment with regard to the effect on um, vulnerable 
honourable group. So we've raised all of those points um, in meetings. So um, the other part of our thinking at RPS is that everywhere where a patient um, in a care setting comes in contact with medicines, there should be a pharmacist there. Some of you will be aware that we've um, just launched a campaign on uh, better use of pharmacists in care homes. There should be a named pharmacist in every care home. We have not said anything about who that pharmacist should be. We believe community pharmacists can provide that service. The DH might have slightly different views. And again, it's up to, I think, the profession to make the case for um, what, what can happen. But the other aspect that we're concerned about is currently the um, contractual framework doesn't talk a lot about quality and that seems to be an area where we should be focusing our efforts. There seems to be a desire to separate supply from um, clinical services and I can't really understand the thinking that um, wants to do that because people in some parts of DH and government don't seem to appreciate that if you've got the, dis the supply network you can build on that. It's a foundation if you like, it's not a, a separate building. We also put forward um, an idea that some of the pharmacies, uh, community pharmacies, could form a network of urgent and um, emergency care um, type first, first point and contact pharmacies. Um, and made quite a lot of comments that if pharmacies were to close, we should be looking at um, things like mergers, um, the law needs to change to facilitate that, and that a two or three pharmacist model might also be looked at in these, um, in these situations. Again, this is all about responding to the current pressures in the health service and making sure that um, we make the case for taking the pressure, again, off GPs and ONU. So there are... Um, we also looked at our, our vision for the future, if you like, and again, it comes back to the basic point is access to high quality care, advice and medicines from pharmacists. And although we've got including those working in community pharmacies, um, I think everything we put in our submission was aimed to be helpful to the community pharmacy network. Now, um, we'll come on to the integration fund in a minute, but it, it is clear from um, Simon Stevens, everything he's talked about in the five-year forward view, that the, the current thinking is to have health professionals working together in some sort of team. It's something of a, a shame that very few of the vanguards include pharmacy, but um, in a way, what we're trying to um, put forward is that the integration fund should be a, a sort of pharmacy vanguard. And we're very clear, I'll come on to this later, we're very clear that it has to stay within pharmacy and we don't have um, GPs or other people trying to get their hands on it. So where um, bids, I think, will be successful is where there is an evidence of working with other parts of the health service, um, where there is focus on the frail elderly. Um, if you mention the frail elderly in any meeting at the moment, um, people's ears break up. Um, Long-term conditions, it seems to be such a no-brainer that we should be doing some of this work and taking the pressure off GPs that I, I can't understand why it has, hasn't had more traction. But one of our later campaigns this year will be focusing on, on that area. Um, we also need to push the public health agenda and certainly in meetings with the minister who's quite well connected with local government because he used to have that portfolio, we have been raising concerns about potential decommissioning of public health services from pharmacy because of the cuts in the public health budget. Um, and the digitally enabled is um, actually we do need to get away from the facts as our most progressive form of technology. 
um, but I think we can do it better. A lot of pharmacies aren't plugged into NHS networks um, and it can be problematic in receiving and sharing of information. Um, and we put it accessible because, again, one of our red lines, if we're allowed red lines in the consultation, is that actually no patient should have worse out access as a result of these changes. Sandra? Sorry to interrupt, but apparently, can you make the mic slightly closer to your mouth, mouth because it's not picking up fully for the back? Oh, right, sorry, I'm usually very loud, so um, <laughs> I'm just trying to be a bit more subdued on Sunday morning in case any of you had a, a good night last night, so um, apologies for that. Is that better? Yes. Right, okay. Um, so the pharmacy access scheme. Now, this is um, a scheme we don't yet know what, whether the... Funding for this is coming from within the, goal, the global sum or without. So in our submission we have asked some questions um, about that because actually it's quite significant. We were originally led to believe that it was separate, but recent conversations have not clarified that. So we've, we've asked the specific question. We're very clear that people um, do need access to a pharmacy and we think we will have um, failed if that diminishes. We've had reassurances that, yes, yes, that's, um, that, that's absolutely fine, we're, we're with you on that, and we will have failed if patients have worse access. Well, all I can say is government is, um, well, the government road, if you like, is paved with failures of good intentions that haven't quite been realised. So I do think we have to be vigilant on this, because the formula they have come up with is extremely complicated. Um, and I know that the more complicated a formula is for deciding whether you get funding or not, the, how should I put this nicely, the more prone it is to manipulation and changes and um, obfuscation. The other concern, though, is that there's absolutely no quality measure in any of this. So um, if, and I say if, if pharmacies are to close, we need to ensure that we keep it the same access at work, but we also make sure there's enough capacity in any remaining system, and also don't lose services as a result. I think that's quite a tall order for any um, government. We've raised concerns about pharmaceutical needs assessments because we're not even sure who's deciding um, how this money will be spent, this clarification in the year. Um, and again, we've made the case that in some cases we probably actually need to be using more pharmacists because I don't think that case is made often enough. Um, I think the integration fund is where the opportunities are. And the purpose, the prime purpose, should be to improve care. Um, we mentioned that primary care, and I just want to reassure you that when we mention primary care in our documents, we're not talking about primary care pharmacists. We're not excluding them, but we're talking about the whole area of community pharmacy and primary care pharmacy, as, as we traditionally know it, because there is significant overlap. We've made it very clear that we think the bid should be pharmacist-led. Um, I have to tell you that community pharmacy really need to concentrate quite hard on this in areas because hospital pharmacy is already looking at this and thinking that there might be scope for them to get involved. And actually, if we could improve joined up working between hospital and community, that I think wouldn't be a, a bad thing, it would probably be a very good thing. But there's going to be a lot of competition for this money. In itself, it sounds like quite a lot of money. It's not if you divide it among the number of pharmacies in the UK. It's not intended to be divided. It's meant to be, um, if you like, something akin to pharmacy vanguard money so that new projects can be trialled. But what there is no guarantee of is if something is successful, what's the mechanism then for 
introducing a new service at, at scale um, and there seems to be no thinking at, about that at all, which is rather worrying. We've asked if there are more bids than you um, can possibly cope with and if they're good bids, would there be a potential for more money? And we've actually had a, a personal reassurance from the Minister that if he, he felt that was the case, he would make the case with Treasury. So um, it's up to us, actually, as a profession, to try and make something of the hand we've been dealt. We've also um, been very clear that we need proper read-write access to patient records and that this there's a greater imperative to have this sooner if there are going to be changes in the network. Um, I've run through what we were talking about um, with urgent care pharmacies as a, as a model for um, something different. It doesn't mean to say, I just want to reassure you, <coughs> that any other pharmacies are any sort of second best. It's a way of providing an enhanced service um, in, a, in its broadest sense in an area. Um, now what would we think be a problem? The, there's some talk about the money could be used for the clinical role of pharmacists and GP practices, care homes and urgent care clinical hubs. We are not happy that that money is used for more pharmacists and GP practices because we think if that model works then the practices should fund it. So this, this is not something that finds particular traction with us. There is a case for um, if you can think of a clinical role in your community pharmacy that you want to develop in conjunction with the local GPs or um, the local hospital then that doesn't stop any of that happening. But um, that was the thinking in the government response, and I actually think it was just put there because they, that was all they could think of when they were writing the document. That's coming on the cynic, if you like. Um, very, very keen that more pharmacists become independent prescribers. And in London, actually, the L, I think the LPC, North East London, has secured funding so that a tranche of community pharmacists can um, have a prescribing qualification. Because if there's a, a bigger critical mass, then we'll be able to provide more services. And I think that's the future of the way things are going, because increasingly it's looking as though students will come out of university prescribing ready, almost, and you know, after some supervisory, supervisory period, will be um, able to become prescribers. So we kind of have to catch up as oldies. Too late for me, but a lot of people in this room would be helpful for. And if there's more of a critical mass, we can make sure that more services are commissioned. Um, there's a barrier at the moment because you have to be supervised by a GP or a dentist, quite bizarrely. Um, and we're trying to get that, or we will be, trying to get that changed so that a pharmacist can be the supervisor. Because um, after all, we know far more about drugs than a dentist does. Worrying bit is the, um, the so-called efficiencies in medicine supply. I actually think, I would say this because I'm a community pharmacist by background, I actually think it's a pretty efficient system where most people can get their medicine straight away or within a few hours at their local community pharmacy. And I don't think we sell that enough sometimes. It's, it's a fantastic distribution network and a fantastic network for um, adding on advice. We have raised significant concerns that if you try and move more towards a, an Amazon type model um, or home delivery services such as in the States, that you are losing opportunities for the pharmacist to interact with the patient. The response seems to be, oh, well, in the States they ring them up. It's not the same, because sometimes when you have somebody coming into the pharmacy, you realise it might be something they've had before and looks fairly bog standard, but there is something that, when you talk to that patient, makes you talk further. And 
also provide the kind of public health lifestyle interventions. All of that wraparound type care stands to be lost. And we have um, made this point very, very, very strongly. The, oh, I must just mention length of treatment. Again, um, we feel that uh, an arbitrary, the initial slide deck seemed to say, oh, let's move to 84 days where appropriate. Um, we think that decision should be pharmacist-led in consultation with the patient. Um, because it's not appropriate for quite a number of patients to just come back every three months. If they're just on thyroxine or something, maybe so. But um, it's, the care is decreasing, I think, with some of these proposals. And the evidence base is not there. And it's rather frustrating, I have to say, that time after time after time, we are prevented from introducing new services because of a lack of an evidence base, and there is absolutely no evidence base for this. The other thing that's coming down the track, just to depress you even further, is the, um, I don't know how many of you are aware of the Falsified Medicines Directive. Hands up if you're aware that this is coming. Oh, quite a lot of you, that's good. Um, well, it's looking like a complete nightmare, as far as I can see, where um, the, the, you're going to have to scan things in front of the patient. How that works with the hub and spoke model, I don't know. You're going to have to put <coughs> things back on the shelf and write them off if they're not picked up within, I think, nine days or ten. something? Ten. Ten days. So, how many of you have got stock on your shelves older than ten days old, waiting for collection by patients? Yeah, well, pretty much everybody had a thought. Um, in fact, you're lucky usually if you pick them up within 10 days. Um, so we, we have huge concerns about the potential for joining this up. And we have flagged those up privately um, as well. Now, the new hub and spoke models are supposedly not cheaper. Um, they're supposed to free up pharmacists' time. Um, I think that's yet to be proven. We've come up with a whole load of um, enablers in our um, submission to DH, and they're all up there. Most of them I've mentioned, actually. But we'll let this slide deck be available so that you can check on what we've done. But we felt it was important to not just say what we wanted to happen, but to say some of the things that needed to happen in, in order to achieve any sort of um, vision. So we've had some media, um, some, some, sorry, we've had some bits in the media. We're working with the other organisations. Um, there's a steering group being set up, so we are coordinating. We are not all doing exactly the same thing. That doesn't mean that the aim isn't right, but it is sometimes appropriate for our response as a um, professional leadership body to be different to um, the others. And I think I, I've touched on that. But so we haven't signed the petition. And some of you might be a bit concerned about that. So I just want to um, say why. And it comes back to my initial point about rep representing pharmacists rather than pharmacies. Having said <coughs> that, we're, we would happily encourage people to um, sign it if asked and they felt strongly about it. But we're making other patient related points and putting the argument in a slightly different way. So similarly we're not telling all our members to write to MPs. And there's a very simple reason for that. It's that the NPA, um, and I think Pearson C probably as well, are already doing that. And the last thing a Member of Parliament wants is to be bombarded by um, slightly different messages, potentially, from different organisations. And it, it, you can over overkill something. So what we're doing is quietly talking to the parliamentarians that we already have a good relationship with, um, so that they are aware of what's happening. As a result of that, there have been um, there's been some activity. Certainly, there's a uh, there was a debate last week, which I don't think we can take credit for, but there is something in the House of Lords uh, next week, which um, came from one of our contacts. But the important thing is that we're actually 
combined and significant and joined up on this. But we have to, I'll just leave this final thought. It's probably no longer enough to say we can't shut pharmacies, it's terrible. Actually, I agree with that sentiment, so don't get me wrong. But if we truly want to get help and support from those in high places who can give us that help and support, we actually have to have a coherent vision for the future. And hopefully, by all talking here today and breakout sessions later, we can start to shape some of that. So thank you very much for um, showing your interest on a Sunday morning. Thank you.